Hi, Joe. Thank you so much for speaking to me today. You're very welcome. I'm looking forward to、uh, having our conversation today about such an important topic. I read your book on addictions a long time ago, and then I also attended one of your workshops that you did for Innate Health. So, can、mm-hmm. you just give、um, an idea as to why you don't practice traditional psychology anymore? What shifted for you? Well, I started out,、um, you know, why I got into the profession, probably like you. Uh, Ronnie is. I, I just wanted to help people. You know, I wanted to alleviate suffering, and I didn't know what that was going to look like. But I eventually ended up studying psychology and thinking, okay, I could be a counselor. That'll <laughs> that'll do it. And、um, so I got into psychology and went to graduate school and studied all the theories, Freud and Adler, and on and on, and behaviorism, etc. And、um, but I I really got into family therapy. Um, and got to study with some of the best family therapists in the world, Virginia Satir and Milton Erickson and、wow. um, Carl Whitaker and a lot of really amazing people. And so I really had a very、um, busy, successful practice. But underneath all of that, I was always drawn to working in the addiction field,、uh, just as kind of a fateful thing when I was an intern. Uh, uh, doing my internship at a mental health center, they would, had just gotten their grant, and so they needed someone to be the director of the addiction program. And so they they said, "Joe, you're in charge of the addiction program,、uh, drug and alcohol." And I said, "Well, I don't have any training in that." And they said, "Well, no one else does either, but you're it." <laughs> <laughs> so I was kind of thrown in the deep end of the pool, and、uh, hung out with a lot of people in AA. Uh, one man in particular who kind of took me under his wing and、uh, you know introduced me to that world from his own recovery and his experience, but also、um, you know just kind of being in the trenches, driving people to the state hospital when they were withdrawing from drugs or alcohol, and,、uh, and so it was very interesting. But I fell in love with alcoholics and drug addicts. I just loved people who were in recovery. They felt so grateful to be alive. And so I always have found myself going back to that field, even though I trained in many other aspects. And I ended up being the director of prevention of alcoholism for the state of Texas、uh, for a while, and trained counselors who were addiction counselors.、Um, and、uh, when I moved back to Minnesota from Texas, I worked at the Johnson Institute, which is a premier training center for addiction counselors. And doing、uh, research and mostly training there, and that's where I met Virginia Satir,、uh, who was our consultant,、uh, family, very well-known family therapist. And so, I, I I thought for someone to be in full recovery and to discover their mental health, they had to go back through the past and work through all these issues. And so, when I started my private practice. That's what I did. I had men's groups, I did family therapy, I took people on retreats. But it was all about, in order to be well, you have to go through the trauma of the past, relive it, re-experience the catharsis of the emotions, and after you do that, then you'll be happy. You'll be fine. But what I found was people didn't really get well. They just got coping mechanisms. And they would have a, a period of feeling well, but they didn't know what mental health was. They didn't really know what、um, peace of mind was. They were they were still struggling, and、uh, members of support groups and counseling, and they, it was like they they learned how to cope with their disabilities, but they didn't know how to transcend them. And so I was getting burned out because my Patients were the same ones would come back over and over again, and I began to get discouraged seeing that I'd fix one issue and then there would be another issue, and they'd fix that one and then there'd be another issue, and it was just like this cafeteria plate of issues, and there was no end to it. So I thought something is missing, and I、uh, I knew I wasn't really helping people, and most importantly, I was burned out and stressed because this was painful work. So my dear friend uh, Keith Blevins, uh, Dr. Keith Blevins, who I had gone to graduate school with, kept contact with him over the years. 
He was one of the first psychologists to meet Sidney Banks, along with Roger Mills and George Pransky, and went to Salt Spring and studied with Sid. And he kept uh, encouraging me to listen to Sid's tapes and all of this, and I just thought, oh, it's just some other new age thing. I was very cynical at that stage of my career. But he invited me to hear Sid speak at the medical school at the University of Miami in 1980, which coincidentally was I met my wife four hours before I met Sid Banks that same day. Wow. And I fell in love with her that day and met Sid Banks the same day. <laughs> and we've been married 40 years <laughs> now. <laughs> yeah. It was, I don't know what my astrology chart would have looked like that day, but it was really good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that began uh, when I first heard Sid, I had a dual reaction because part of me was like, I finally have found the secret of mental health. This is it. The principles we've been looking for. The other part of me was like, oh my God, I've labored for 10 years to create this system of thought around all these theories and he just pulled the pin right out from underneath me and they all collapsed and so I felt very anxious and I wanted to run out of the room it was very threatening to me as a psychologist to hear what he was saying as if it was true I've been going in the exact opposite direction of what I should have been doing but I was falling in love <laughs> And that kept me in the conversation. <laughs> Good thing. <laughs> I think God tricked me, you know, it was yeah. just this big trick, you know. <laughs> and so I went back to Minnesota that next uh, week and went back to my private practice in Minneapolis. I had a very successful practice. And I sat down with my patients and I, I didn't know what to say anymore. I would say the old things and it didn't feel right, but I didn't know what else to do. It was very hard transition for me. But every now and then I would say something from my heart, you know, just spontaneously. And they would look at me and they go, wow, that was really powerful. Why didn't you tell me that before? <laughs> and it was from the three principles. And I started seeing that, that I would just say a little bit about what I was beginning to know, and it would have huge impact on my patients. And so within a few months, they were graduating. And my patients never graduated. <laughs> they were always going to be in therapy forever. <laughs> and um, and so I, my patients really taught me the power of Sid's understanding of the three principles psychology. So that was the beginning uh, of my uh, transformation or shift in my, my paradigm of how to help people with mental health and addiction issues. And um, and then we started uh, an institute, the Minneapolis Institute of Mental Health with Chris Heath, and treated thousands of people with addictions and mental health and schizophrenia and you name it, every, every major mental health issue. And uh, the results were just extraordinary. And um, it's just, uh, you know, I've never looked back after that. So given that you have done so much uh, work on addiction, how how would you have seen it, you know, treating addiction from the traditional psychology paradigm, and how do you do it now with the three principles understanding? Mm -hmm. So I've consulted with many treatment centers for addiction that are dual diagnosis treatment centers. They treat people with mental health issues and addictions. And so we 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 treat people where they're at. You know, when people come into our center, um, they may need medical detox, some more than others. Um, and so we have a medical unit with a doctor, an addiction specialist, um, a nursing staff, and they spend up to five days, sometimes more, in the hospital wing of the, of the treatment center. And so we first take care of their bodies and the physical addiction. And, and it's a holistic approach. So we do sauna detox, um, brain balancing, uh, help get their the cobwebs out, <laughs> so to speak, and get them eating healthy, sleeping regularly. So the first couple of weeks of treatment is really just bringing their physical 
and brain health back to a certain level. All during that time, they're being introduced to gradually the, the three principles. They, they might attend a group or, or the talk or listen to, they get the serenity principle, my first book, uh, and they start, but you know, their head is so foggy in the beginning. Um, but, and then a lot of the people who are chemically dependent also suffer from severe chronic depression, anxiety disorders, the whole gamut, you know, you're a psychiatrist, that, you know, you, but what I, what I found, and this is the, my point is that at the, at the root of all mental illness and addiction is a disconnection from our true self, from our source of resilience, our source of positive feelings, uh, clear thinking or insights, wisdom. So the cure for mental health and addiction is the same. Um, everybody's a little different. Some people need a lot more repair uh, because of the nature of their addiction or their longevity of mental health issues. Um, so it's individualized. The treatment is individualized. But at the heart of it is uh, when people begin to have an experience of their innate mental health, they may see a sunset and they feel a tremendous feeling of serenity cross over them. And they think it's the sunset. And what we point them back to that that feel, you've seen a million sunsets in your life, but you saw that one the first time and it impacted you. That came from you. That's your mental health. That's your innate resilience. So we kind of, we keep pointing them back to this power, this resource within them. And so human beings can cover that innate mental health or resilience up with a misuse of thought, with a use, misuse of their mind. So the whole program, whether it's addiction or mental health, is about educating people how their mind works. Not their brain, but their mind. That there's, mind is this universal intelligence, this life force, this uh, spark that we're all a part of the bigger whole. And when we feel connected to that, we have contentment, peace of mind, a sense of purpose, our calling, we feel connected to ourselves, the world, and other people. We feel um, a uh, when we have emotions and upset, but we we recover from them. We rebound more quickly. That's the nature of resilience: is to rebound quickly, more quickly from adversity. So, as people's mental health comes up. For example, when I ran a mental health center, the psychiatrist who knew nothing about the three principles, you know, major mental illnesses in our caseload, and he would be the doctor that came in and do the prescriptions like uh, you, you've learned to do. And he was fascinated because he consulted with many clinics, more traditional than ours. And he said, your patients, I have to keep reducing their medication every time I see them because they're getting uh, side effects from the from the drug. I've never seen this before. Now most of them are on like a placebo level of the drug, the ones with schizophrenia and paranoid personality, etc. And he said, what's up with that? <laughs> so he got curious about what was going on, but he never really, you know, he was all biology oriented, you know, brain chemistry. Um, but it, I thought it was interesting because as people's mental health went up, their symptoms decreased. And even though they may still be on some of the medication, um, it was a, a, a dosage that was not toxic to their system. They just got the good benefit, not the toxicity of the, of the drug. So even with severe mental health problems or brain disorders, injury, the understanding the reawakening of that mental health, it's like, um, it's like with COVID, <laughs> we're in the era of COVID, you know, as people's immune system gets increased, maybe it was more vitamin D or, you know, sunlight or, you know, all the different ways that we can increase the, the power of the immune system. 
it doesn't keep you from getting COVID, but you don't get as sick. You recover more quickly. This is kind of like that with mental health and addictions. It's strengthening the psychological immune system. And the, the principles are like a vaccine for mental illness and unhappiness and violence and all the ills that face us. So um, the way we, we treat people is we, I, I use all of the things that I learned as a clinical psychologist still, and, and psychiatrists who use this approach. You still, you don't throw out everything that you knew, but you use it more judiciously, more pointedly, mm. more, uh, not too much, you know, overdosing a patient is can be lethal. So you 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 treat the whole person, body, mind, and spirit. And when you treat the whole person, your your results are exponentially better than if you're just treating the symptomatology. Can you say how you go into how you have gone into the traditional paradigm and have been able to share a spiritual understanding? I, I see myself as kind of a bridge uh, to other professions, and um, that's just my role. I, I I I'm more like an anthropologist in a way. When I go in and work with an organization, a company the Mayo Clinic or worked with lots of hospital systems over the years. Um, I meet them where they're at and find out what is it that they need. And um, one hospital system I worked with, North Memorial, they um, their, their mission was to be a caring institution, not just healthcare, but a caring institution. But when they were all so burned out, they were just sniping at each other. The doctors, the nurses, everybody was just burned out and angry and short. And they they weren't caring anymore. They were really. And so they wanted me to help bring the culture back to its original inspiration to be a truly caring institution. So I just taught them the principles through uh, understanding um, how to listen to your patients how to be a better listener to your coworkers and to your patients. And so we just, and we did a lot, but we taught it, had to teach them about the principles in order to teach them about listening. So this is how your mind works. And when your mind is quiet, you listen better than if you're interpreting or projecting or all of that. And so that was kind of the entry point with that. So I worked with them for about four years, trained all the nurses and all the, um, Mavis Karn and I worked together on that. And it completely changed the culture. You'd go in there and people were friendly. Um, they got along with each other. Their colleagues changed. And it, I didn't work with the whole system. I just worked with maybe 5% of the system. But because they were in leadership roles, new su nurse supervisors, medical directors, etc., the whole system, it rippled out. It, it had a shift. You could just, when you walked in, you could, it felt like it used to. It felt even better than it used to. It had a warmth to it. Uh, um, they weren't sniping at the doctors, the nurses. They were, they were more compassionate with each other. Uh, and so it was really, uh, so now with Mayo Clinic, I, the way I got into that, I was just coaching a doctor, uh, an emergency doctor who worked at the main center in Rochester and uh, just on his personal life and did an intensive with him. And um, and he changed. He was one of the best patients I've ever had. He changed so quickly. And, and then he was interviewing to be the CEO of Mayo in, in Arizona, Scottsdale. And, and the way he showed up, he was just himself. He wasn't trying to convince anyone he should be the boss or anything. They hired him like that. He was, it was a no brainer. He was the guy they needed. So he came in and I kept being his coach and, and he was just a, just a masterful leader. He just so good at dealing with crises and 
situations and um and everybody admired him and wondered how how do you stay so calm and, and under all this stress and you've got so many responsibilities and he's traveling all over the world he's going to china and he's you know because mail is everywhere now all over the world and um so he says i want my i want my colleagues to learn this i want my whole staff to learn the principles because it's helped me so much but we have to be really careful how we say it <laughs> Because they don't want to be spiritual. You, you can't talk anything spiritual and blah, blah, blah. And I said, so we'll, I said, well, we'll, we'll see a way to do it. And so we were thinking we would do it by working with the safety teams, uh, you know, safety protocols. And they train people in the safety standards and all that so you don't get sued and so you don't have medical mistakes and errors. Um, but then Mail uh, print, came out with a study on burnout. And um, the burnout rate had gone from 20 some percent to like 50 percent uh, nationally in America. And so he said, that's how we're going to do it. We're going to teach resilience to physicians because every every male clinic physician we lose costs us a million dollars to replace them. A million dollars for everyone we lose to burnout. And, and that's how we'll get to the whole system. So, so I had, Keith Clevins and I, we had to go, we, he, we set it up, we did a four day retreat with all of the department chairs, neurology, psychiatry, uh, surgery, um, uh, yeah, every department. Talk about intimidating. <laughs> what am I doing at the Mayo Clinic? How did I get here? <laughs> What am I going to say? This, I'm going to, you know, uh, I'm not a doctor. You know, I'm not an MD. Well, they listen to me. So I had all these insecure thoughts about it. But um, so we set it up as a retreat and we invited them to bring their spouses as well. So there was about 20 of them, 20 department chairs and their spouses. And during the seminar part, the spouses would go off and go golfing or at, the, at this resort, lay by the pool or whatever. And then uh, at night, then we'd have programs for them. And uh, so the first day I went in there, and the first thing is just the head of surgery gets, what kind of crap is this? There's no three-ring binder. Uh, what uh, Do you have CMUs for this? And blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and we thought, oh, God. This oh, is not what I've signed up for. This is going to be interesting. <laughs> so, um, so we go ahead and just start talking about resilience and, and and the ceo talks about how this has helped him and you know kind of sets the tone and introduced me and dr blevins and then um pretty soon we're teaching about i don't even remember what what we were teaching but at the beginning the very beginning and that same surgeon stands up and he said this is a bunch of bs he didn't say bs but i'll say it on this video uh, mm -hmm. a doctor has to be in control of his nurses if you're not in control, you lose you lose patience. Blah blah blah. And he, was, and he really and he had just gotten back from the war in Iraq, doing surgery in a war zone. So he was probably a bit traumatized and PTSD anyway. Mm. And so it was he was just in a rage. He turned bright red and he was screaming at us. And I thought, oh, this isn't going well. We're in trouble. <laughs> so I said, let's just take a break. And so we took a break and I said to Keith, I said, God, now what are we going to do? And he says, I don't know what we're going to do. And I said, I don't either, but I know I'll know what to say when I go back in there. I don't know what I'm going to say, but I just have confidence. So we came back from the break and he's just talking to everybody else, trying to create negativity in the group. Why do we have to be here? And blah, 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 you know? Mm -hmm. And so I walked right up to him in front of the group and I just had a conversation with him. And out of my wisdom, I don't know, the words came and somehow he calmed down. And then everybody else said, yeah, Harry, shut up. We want to learn from the guys. <laughs> so he didn't ever say another <laughs> word. <laughs> but then out of that, you know, I, the, the vehicle to teach them was to be resilient. How do you find your resilience? How do you find that feeling you had when you were a young doctor and you were so passionate about getting into this field and how do you sustain that? So that was our, 
vehicle for teaching the principles. And so we did that, and then we followed it up with another two-day seminar, and we did coaching with anyone who wanted it. And um, probably 40% of them really changed. They had a insight. And their department started to change. And so they said, mm. we want this for our staff, our doctors and nurses. And so then we had the bigger program. Oh, there's a person from Ireland calling me about <laughs> Who who's <laughs> okay. teaching? She's the head of nursing in Northern Ireland. Anyway, <laughs> so um, so it it was an organic change, and the leaders changed the tenure of their meetings, the tone of their meetings changed, the way they dealt with conflict changed, they listened better to their employees created a rippling effect in the organization. And the more people that went to this two-day workshop got coaching, and then um, there was a, another half-a-day program six months later, it gradually dropped the burnout rate dramatically in the organization. But we only worked with maybe 1% of the people. So... Um, when you, when you, uh, we didn't talk spiritual, we just talked principles, but it woke people's understanding up of the spiritual nature of the mind. The mind is not the brain. It, there's something deeper than brain than conditioning than biology. There's a, there's a, the, the, the root of the word psychology is psyche, which means mind. A body, mind, and spirit. Or uh, I think the, is body, mind, soul. Is the the Greek uh, root of the word. And so psychology has thrown the soul, the spirit, out. And it's just been focused on behavior. In the body. You know, emotions, history. So this psychology, because I was, I had a religious background, I was going to be a Catholic priest at one time. And even though I'm not a religious person at this point in time, I, I, I knew as a therapist that until people had some sort of a transformational awakening, they, their, their changes were not permanent. There wasn't a real shift in consciousness. So when you understand mind as a spiritual, invisible thing that's beyond the body, you begin to understand what intuition is, insight is, creativity, all these things that seem to emerge from the, the nothingness that keep evolving and changing a human being and the world. So um it's a, a little bit of an end run with physicians and working in, in healthcare that you, you just have to educate them about how the mind works and the nature of mental health and resilience. And people begin to experience, they have spiritual experiences. They have out of the blue experiences more often. And they begin to trust that little voice inside that's guiding them to and they do it all the time, you know, it's it's a good bedside manner, it's hunches, it's something tells me that I that this medication isn't right for this patient, but logically I, I shouldn't be thinking that, but something tells me I should check this out. And so often that hunch, which has no basis in fact or information, saves a life. You talked about programs and so on, but some people might not have gone to programs. They might just be saying, I just need some help. Yeah. You know, I, I'm just struggling to cope. Give me some coping strategies, for example. Mm -hmm. So what would you say to that? Well, the first thing I tell people is about the nature of resilience, that resilience, every child is born resilient. It just gets covered up. And um, 
and you can't destroy that resilience. You can block it out of consciousness. You cannot listen to it, but it can't be destroyed. So resilience is part of our design as human beings. We're designed to rebound from adversity, to learn from mistakes, to be up against something and then have an insight that takes us beyond it, whether it's a personal issue, a business issue, a health issue, or whatever. So I kind of first start with the assumption that Resilience isn't something you do or that you learn how to do. It's something that needs to be reawakened in you consciously. And what keeps resilience from coming to the surface is a misunderstanding of the nature of experience and the nature of how the mind works. So that's where the principles come in. So we're always living in a, in a world of thought, wall-to-wall thought, every Every perception we have is mediated via thought. Every emotion we have, because everyone reacts, reacts emotionally differently to the exact same circumstance, the variable is how, what they're thinking. The pin, that determines how they perceive it. Is that an opportunity or is that a setback or is that an op, um, good luck or misfortune? So the old saying, beauty is in the eyes of the beholder is another way of saying it. Ugliness is in the eyes of the beholder. Everything is in the eyes of the beholder because of we're always thinking and whatever we're thinking is creating our moment-to-moment experience of whatever we're involved in. Whatever, whether we're at work or whether we're in a relationship or driving our car, car through traffic, we're always, our, our our feelings are constantly ch- changing depending on what we're thinking. So experience or life, our life experience is coming not from out there, from our past, our circumstances, other people, the pandemic, traffic, the profession. It's coming from how I am interpreting that, perceiving that through the power of thought. So that's the second principle. The third principle is that to varying degrees, we're either conscious that we're doing that or not. And the more we're conscious that our experience 100% is coming from the inside out rather than the outside in, the more we see that, the more empowered we are as human beings. The less we feel victimized, the more hope we have that... This too shall pass. You know, I know right now it looks really bad, but I'll just wait and and maybe I'll get some better thinking about how to look at this. And in my book, I give hundreds of examples of people in very stressful situations, whether it's police officers, corporate leaders, physicians, nurses, uh, psychologists, teachers, etc., that when they're in a situation and they're really up against it and they start having a psychological meltdown when they remember the principle of thought that, Oh, wait a minute, this could have something to do with my thinking. It, it does something for them. It helps clear their mind, get a, get a moment of clarity and they go, Whoa, wait a minute. I hadn't, I was just really reacting to this. I was just caught up and taking it personally. And I just kind of step back and I can see, Oh, that person just needs some encouragement or, oh boy, you know, or they feel compassion for the person that's yelling at them. So the more you understand that, the more you stay grounded in your mental, mental health, your resilience, your innate capacity to roll with the punches. Life is a very challenging thing at times. And when you understand that, it, that, it, that it's what you make of what's happening that's creating your experience, not what's happening to you or has happened to you or might happen to you. It's all thought, wall to wall. And as your level of consciousness goes up and down, sometimes you see that and sometimes you don't. And when you don't, you're, you're a victim of your own thinking. And when you do see it, 
it clears your mind and you begin to see infinite possibilities of how you can respond. So when we understand that, the principles of how reality is created, and that we're designed uh, from the beginning to have insight and to evolve in our consciousness. Evolution is designed into us. So the, the more you understand, it's like understanding the principles of how a sport works. Once you, you really get the basics of it, the more you practice, the better you get. But if you don't understand the fundamentals, you can practice forever and you don't get it. You don't get any better. Mm. So we've been fed a lot of misinformation over the millennial about how mind works. And with an education of the mind and an understanding that we're designed for happiness, we're designed for creativity, we're designed for adaptability, we're ad designed for evolution. When you have that assumption, rather than you're just a product of your past or your genetics or, you know, your karma or whatever, you, you, you then see that you have all of this freedom that you didn't know you had. So that's... And, and the other thing I tell people is that you were, you're going to forget this. <laughs> you're going to get caught up in your thinking, guaranteed, and you're going to have a negative emotional experience. And every time that happens, it, because you now have an understanding of how it works, it helps you continue to evolve. So I'm giving you a two-day seminar in 10 minutes, but that's the essence of it. And then we... Yeah, we trained doctors to facilitate the small group so they would be further along in their understanding and they would share as a surgeon, as a, uh, a, a infection specialist, how they dealt with how the principles helped them deal with a co-worker they couldn't stand or a difficult patient. And they go, oh, wow, this stuff really works. And they, they start seeing because it's coming from another doctor or another nurse not just a silly psychologist who sounds like he doesn't know what he's doing. Um, they start, so that it, it just created this momentum because people's uh, prominent researchers, the head of research for Mayo, he got it like that. He was amazing. And he says, well, that's the whole secret to science. If you can't think out of the box, if you can't have creative possibility thinking, you'll never discover anything new. Yeah. And he's mm -hmm. he's like one of our biggest yeah. supporters. Beautiful. I'm just thinking about the impact, you know, the impact that happens. And you said like, you know, when you were sharing with the Mayo Clinic, you might have just touched one percent, but then so many other people got impacted because then they went back and they, you know, their their attitude changed, their behavior mm -hmm. changed. They saw something very fundamentally different. I did want to bring out your book, your latest book. Thriving in the Eye of the Hurricane, Unlocking Resilience in Turbulent Times. Whatever we talked about today is like a concise version of what's in mm -hmm. here. But can you just give people a sense of, you know, if they read this book, what they might benefit from, what they might be able to see a bit deeper? Sure. I didn't think I'd ever write another book. I didn't think I'd write one book, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I've written six books now. <laughs> they just kind of start bubbling up. Wow, six yeah. books. Um, and so this book, when the pandemic hit, and it, it hit me too, and, you know, oh, I was supposed to be in London and give the talk at the annual conference, and now it's on Zoom, and I was supposed to go to Spain for another one. I was all these, because I travel a lot with this understanding. And, and I was thrown for a loop, just like everybody. But it didn't take too long, and I was had my bearings back. You know, oh, okay, well, we're just doing it different. I guess I'll learn how to do Zoom and do counseling on Zoom and do conferences on Zoom. And and uh, and I'll just work in my yard and my garden and I won't go out to restaurants anymore for a while. And uh, so I kind of adapted nicely. And um, not that it was always easy. I had my moments. But and I looked around at the people who understood the three principles and how they were coping with it versus people who didn't have an understanding was night and day. And I, and I just thought um, I was going to write two other books that, that I had in mind. 
The Transformation Principle and The Burnout Solution. Those were the two books I was going to write, but they ended up each becoming a chapter in the book. <laughs> so I didn't waste any, any time. <laughs> and so I decided, um, and actually I didn't really even decide this. Um, uh, my publisher asked me to write this book. They said, you know, people really need a book about how to get through this. Will you write a book about um, resilience and going through the pandemic? And I said, I'll think about it. And then, so then they came up with this title, Thriving in the Eye of the Hurricane. And what a perfect metaphor, because the eye is resilience. The eye is our innate wisdom. It's in our innate mental health. Uh, and in the hurricane, the eye is, is where all the power for all the wind comes from. But in the in the eye, it's very peaceful. Birds fly around in there. It's, it's so it's a beautiful metaphor for the, our innate essence is is this calm center of wisdom and transformation. And so all these books kind of came together, and I I thought that's the perfect title for this book. So this book is like a handbook for people going through not only the pandemic, the the effects of climate change are they're only going to get more severe um you know the coral reefs are <laughs> leaving us the, I'm, I'm actually doing a, a a talk to climate ch uh, change activists with amy mills next month you know to help them stay resilient in trying to help the world see that we need to do something about this um so i just see that everybody needs an understanding of the mind uh, whatever, whether it's running your business or being a doctor like you are, or a nurse in the COVID unit, or um, a politician dealing with the, the polarities in our society, um, teachers in the classroom, everybody, if everybody understood this, it would, we could actually transform the world in many times in history, as I talk about in the first part of the book, it has been in times of adversity, the Black Death, um, the, um, the major floods that happened in parts of Europe, uh, World War II and World War I. It was during those adversity challenges that new inventions, the age of the Industrial Revolution, the uh, birth of democracy, um, the scientific revolution, all happened when people were kind of in lockdown at different times in history. So we're at a time where if we can come out of this with our resilience, we will solve a lot of the problems that have been boiled to the surface. They've all been there, but they're boiled to the surface and heightened. And so we have to evolve in consciousness in order to survive as a people and as a planet. And that's what this book is about. It's a survival manual. For humanity and not just but it's it's a survival manual <laughs> a little play on words it's yeah. a thir sir thrival there's a mouthful it's a sir thrival manual <laughs> so we don't just uh, i know that, i love I, it i just i just yeah i was thinking no it's not the survival it's tribe i just tribe. made that yeah, up yeah right. it's creativity in the moment yeah, yeah. no <laughs> i couldn't hardly thrival. say it survival <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so no, yeah it, i i've gotten so much great feedback and now i'm just going to start working with the local huge healthcare system here the 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 physician there in charge of burnout prevention read it and called me and said you needed to work with our whole organization we have eleven thousand employees we're all burned out <laughs> Wow. So we'll see what happens with that. <laughs> Doors keep opening up, isn't it? You you didn't think your way through all this. It's like you're just showing up and then your resilience is showing up. You know what to do because you had other ideas yeah. in terms of writing books and this showed up. And again, you know, we are having all these conversations and I'm also bringing it to the world of mental health and how this might help professionals like not just doctors uh, or nurses it's like therapists counselors mm -hmm. anyone working in the field yeah. of mental health and you know wanting to help people uh, remind them of their innate resilience and, and but first of all 
seeing their own inner resilience because we need to yeah. see our uh, our own resilience before we try to point people to their resilience isn't it more than anything what helps people is um hope so even if you listen to this video and you just think you heard a little something but you didn't quite get it if you have a little bit of hope hope is a, a catalyst for an open heart and an open mind and when your mind is open, you'll start having your own insights. You'll start seeing this for yourself. So you may listen to this and think, God, what are they talking about? I don't understand. It goes totally against everything I've been trained in, blah, 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 blah. But if you, part of you got curious and a little bit of hope, that's enough to open your mind to your own wisdom that will because that's the only way this changes anybody. I could give a lecture on the three principles and it wouldn't do any good. But if you heard something yourself and you got an insight, then your life would change. So this isn't something you could put into people. It's something that is already in people that you, it's kind of like a, I, we got a amaryllis plant and it arrived in the mail from Holland and uh, it's just in a box and it was a pot and it was a bunch of, dirt and it was nothing they said just remove the the covering and water it and a few days later <laughs> amaryllis was this high wow and i thought wow you know put it in sunlight and so then i watered again a few days later and now it's about this high and this high so the potential was all in the bulb it just needed light and water and soil and we're, as human beings, we're like that plant. We just need light and enlightenment. Uh, we need water for the soul, hope, and we need a good fertile ground to grow in, which we already have because we're a human being given the gift of resilience and mental health. That's our spiritual connection. Oh. Beautiful. What a great way to end this. And I would um, recommend that anyone uh, watching this, please get Joe's book. Um, if you ever get in, he, get to see him in person, obviously take your book and get it signed by by him. And he has written six books in total. <laughs> but um, start with this one because it's the it's really. Um, it's the most topical at the moment, isn't it? You know, we really need to understand mm -hmm. this. And so yeah. um, thank you so much, Joe, for coming today. Well, yes. But can I just course. mention yeah, yeah, one please. other thing that might be of help to the listeners? On my website, I've been doing a podcast on the book. And so all the people that are in the book, I've got videos of me interviewing them oh, wow. for my podcast, or okay. most of them anyway. Not, not all of them, but a lot of them. And so if you want to know more, you can listen to my podcast. Um, I finished the, the people in the book and this next month I'm doing Denise I'm Holland, uh, who's a coach in, in London who works with professional athletes and an Olymp a former Olympic uh, track star from the UK talking about how the principles improve sport performance. So um, that happens once a month, the third um, um, Monday of the month. Uh, or I'm rather Tuesday of the month, third Tuesday of the month, I do um, a podcast on lots of different topics. So there's lots and all the old Fantastic. ones are on there and you can listen to them on Spotify or all the wow. different platforms. Okay, there you are. So all the resources that you need for resilience, uh, to understand about innate resilience and um, how to deal with burnout and support people that you're working with is all in uh, Joe's website. I'll definitely put a link to his website and all the books that he has written so you can start with this one or you can start with any book you like but highly recommend that you follow his work so thank you once again joe for coming here today and speaking to myself i i have been enlightened i you know i love the conversation we we touch so many different areas and um i know that all the people watching this uh, or listening to this would be you know would find it extremely beneficial so thank you so much well, thank you for helping me get this out to the world, Ronnie.